and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Valley of the Judged. I, it is me, your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. Didn't do it this time. Nope, th nope, it wasn't him. OBS fucked me. Yeah, fuck. This is another case of fuck OBS. We had we had a bit of recording going. OBS decided to freeze. I lost the footage. Had to restart, which took which took a bit because my computer likes to take its sweet time restarting. But we decided. But we decided. You know what? Fuck it. We're gonna get, we're gonna power through it because we only lost like thirty minutes, which is peanuts by our standards. Yeah. To quote Shades, quoting Cure. Technology! It likes to give us the middle finger! So, now in the interest of full disclosure, I will note, I did, a few days before this, I did have creator Oscar Watson on the show. I have backed the Kickstarter for this project because I find this to be very interesting. It's essentially taking the taking old school D20 and, and doing an extensive hacking of it. Much in the same way that Heavens and Heresies, which we've been covering on Fridays, is doing an extensive hacking of fi of fifth edition. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that th that this game is taking notes from a few other games. There are four that are specifically mentioned in the credits: Wrath and Glory, which I've already reviewed, and I liked, although I probably won't be returning to that anytime soon because fuck you, GW. Um, Five Torches Deep. Which is actually pretty good, um, especially. I know I know it may sound odd given that given that I've criticized the dependence on dungeon crawl, but Five Torches Deep is going all in on that kind of thing, much in the same way that say Torchbearer does. Um, dungeon World, which is decent, and Tiny Dungeon, which is a very a very nice pick up and play affair. Now, one of the things that we ended up losing early on was talk about Neo Clones, which is the nickname that's unfortunately been given to retro clones that aren't trying to be just a cleaned up version of an earlier edition of D and D, but instead do instead doing their own thing, or in some cases just a reskit, just a reskin of what already what already was. Um, but with dri with or in, and. Uh, or in some, or in some cases, just slightly different in what in ways that you'd have to be extremely anal to br to tell the difference. Hi, Dungeon Crawl Classics. I still like you, but um, the truth is the truth. And so the truth shall shall set you free. <laughs> but with Driven into Darkness, we've got something interesting, and that's why after I after I went over the quick play version myself for preparation in the interview. I decided that it I decided that it should it would make a good candidate for a one-off Valley of the Judged. Oh, uh, and that is what that is what we're going to be doing. Now I I know I s now I will note once again I do find it odd to put a example of play in the uh, right on page 3 of this 46 page document. Mostly mostly because you sh you should typically put this kind of thing a little way like about a third into your book, not not so early on. After we've been introduced to the actual mechanics, rather than before. And I know the argument could be made that um, that it's using the framework of the D twenty system. So, so why so why why would I make a fuss? Well, consider this: Star Wars Saga Edition, True Twenty, and Fantasy Craft all technically use the D20 system. That's where their similarities begin and end. Very different games, each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. But after we get into the credits, we um, it, go it goes into how the game is different, and there are there are three th there are three things that it br that it brings up: the open character builder, which was which was which was created to be as a response to him. Not like not liking the way a lot of class designs essentially have you work up to not sucking. 
And they also don't evolve with you as you evolve as a player. Mm -hmm. So at some point you may feel disconnected from your character because, well, this isn't how you play the game anymore. To put it to put it another way, with a lot of with a lot of class design, especially a lot of old school class design, I do not have a play style with that class. That class has a play style, and I have to force myself into it. Yep. See also character design in Overwatch. <laughs> and so essentially, this uh, this system is a classless system that has a very interesting build mechanic to it. Mm -hmm. Now the player facing one roll d twenty was to try and re was to try and reduce the bullshit when it comes to resolving effects. Um, Cipher system and true twenty have a si have a similar mindset, although true twenty is significantly crunchier than this one, and Cypher System is a little bit on the story gamey end of things. Just a tiny bit. Cypher System is so good, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, just because I said it last time, it has to be said again. One roll to rule them all. One roll to find them. One roll to bring them all. And on your game board, bind them. Probably won't the... If if we if we end up encountering a similar system to this kind of thing, I expect you to do the full poem. You're on. <laughs> and the third part is simultaneous combat rounds, which to keep to keep everyone involved by by minimizing downtime, i.e., no more checking your cell phone. Um. There's also a thing about whether or not characters are human or non-human. I think this is a base. This is a basic way of saying that this game isn't going to be doing a cho a choice of race, which is a, which I believe is a smart move because with what we're going to be seeing later on, trying to put in how you do race would create more problems than it solves. I mean, in theory, you could do it. But the amount of but the amount of hoops that you'd probably have to go through in do, in doing it wouldn't make it worth it. As I've said many times, um, house ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. Which, as a bit of an aside, one thing that I do want to I do want to tackle that I really like with um with this with this document, and I brought it up in the interview is I like the way it sets itself up visually. One could argue that some parts are a little bit scrunched, but just looking at pages is never boring. There's always something di there's always something different, whether it be in the background, whether it be the use of color, whether it be whether it be even simple things like like text boxes or bolding or underlining. It all it's it lo each page looks distinct. Mm -hmm. Now, core setup is get, is d is d is d twenty versus d twenty plus modifiers versus a target number. Um, target number is usually ten plus a relevant modifier, which is a very smart move. I think Shadow, Shadow of the Demon Lord does something similar, where ten is the magic number. Um, players win any ties. Multipliers are additive, and you always round up. You only need one die. Um, some t sometimes, if it'll help speed things along, tell the players the target number. If you d um, bonuses and penal bonus die and penalty die act kind of like um, advantage and disadvantage, except for except for the fact that one they stack, and two. You can choose to trade one of those for a plus two or minus two modifier. <clears throat> now, and of course, there's the rule of um, comeback bonus die, where a fumble can gen can generate one of these bonus die that can be added as a bo as a bo as a bonus die to someone else's roll or a future roll yourself. But it is a, it is a communal thing, so everybody's gonna have it. So don't get greedy with it. 
Essentially, don't be a penis. Mm -hmm. So, when, when I come, then we get to character building, which is a six-step process. The first step is profession, origin, and language. Um, prof which profession and origin is going to give you combat bonus, and. The, I do like that he put in that the players and the GM should work together to establish a group dynamic where the professions and origins that each of them comes up with lines up to both fit the setting and complement each other. In other words, we don't want to have we don't want to have a case of of everyone pl of everyone of the GM deciding, okay, we're running okay, boys, we're running Ravenloft this time. I hope um, keep that keep that in mind with the kind of character sheets you get, and that and then there's that one person in the group who decides to play a warlock. Those are the people you slap upside the head. I don't slap them upside the head. I make them drink the pain glass. I'll leave it up to you, which is worse. Mm-hmm. But now when it comes to generating statistics, you have, you have the basic six, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. They all start at zero, you can adjust them by you can adjust them upwards by mo by by trade by trading off with another. Um, this is capped at plus four, and the lowest you can go is minus seven. It do to its credit, it does give you three suggested arrays. Um, then it and it also it ahead. also notes that any R stat that goes to negate kills your character, mm -hmm. which. I uh, I now realize that there's a pun in there that I don't even know if the creator intended. Neg eight negates your character. I'm gonna chalk that up to accidental. I'm gonna chalk that up to accidental as well, because I'm the genius that figured it out. <laughs> to quote to quote Brother Shades, don't get penisy. <laughs> so step three is character experience. You're you're gonna get three to twelve exper You're gonna get three to twelve experience. Um, once you, if if you've got once you've got twelve experience, you're le you're level one. I think for a lot of people, they're just gonna go with twelve ex experience, especially given how this works. So, base health or B or BH starts at one. Can be a can you can increase you and can increase to a, to a maximum of two above your current level. For for one eight for one XP a piece, and this determines your max health of being BH plus total constitution, um, plus at a, at a minimum of your BH plus ten. So uh, even if your total constitution is below your minimum base health, it's just basically your base health plus your base health at that point. Yeah. Um, if you want if you want to be a spellcaster, that's three XP. Um, then, then comes the the equipment proficiencies. Um, shields are free. Light armor costs one H, one XP, and all armor costs two XP. When it comes to weapon, when it comes to weapon proficiency, you can either be martially disciplined, or as it's written here, maritally maritally disciplined. Um, or you or you can just choose one simple weapon discipline for free. And of, of course, there are six other options that you have one for one XP each. You can increase a raw a raw stat by one. At a get an additional language, get a trait, increase your health mod multiplier. We'll get to that in a minute. Give yourself an additional profession, or increase your magic power. After you've spent the the amount of XP, that amount of XP, you start with a shield, up to four weapons, and a set of armor that you can use. Then you roll, what? Then you then you roll and add one of your mental ability scores to to get your starting provisions. I know it's called raw, I know it's called um called raw called raw called raw or or, fi or um, final stat, but I'm going out of I'm going off of habit. Um. Then now now one XP can be spent uh, to add to a stat's focus modifier. 
and that is capped at your level to at half your level up to a maximum of four. Um, the health multiplier starts at one, can be increased at the cost of one XP, and and this and this um this uh, this plays a factor into into your total health, since one since one of them is going is going to effectively multiply the health formula that we mentioned earlier. And this and health multiplier is capped at five. Then we get to magic power and spellcaster growth, the seventh step in this six-step process. So if you've picked, if you picked, met, if you decide to spend three XP for magic power, you're in, congratulations. You're now a tier one spellcaster. You get one first tier spell for free and one magic power point. You can spend you can spend that to obtain a new sp a new spell with a t with a tier equal to the amount spent. So one for one, two for two, and so on. And and you can spend one X, one XP to increase your magic power by by one tier to a max of one above your current level. Each new tier grants you a spell in the new tier and a number of and a number of magic power points equal to the new tier. And I do I, once again I do appreciate that they put in a um suge a suggested list so that pe so which you can probably mess around with if you so wanted to like if you wanted to give yourself all the first level spells you know be be the equi be the equivalent of a um of a red mage who knows the first first tier spells might actually be super useful. Mm -hmm. So then um every time you get 6 XP you let you increase your level by 1. And something that we had mentioned in the original recording is that we is that this particular approach it is a classless system but it manages to avoid a lot of the problems that happen with classless systems because of the fact that there's there's not there's a very precise amount of options. I won't say limited, precise is a bit is a better word, and none of the options are necessarily bad. There's it you'd have I would say you'd have to really, really try to have a gimp ass character set up with this. It's a small set of selections. All of them are effective in some fashion. Mm -hmm. You're never making a wrong choice. And I and I'd look forward to see what sort what sort of crazy ass setups we can we can get out of this. Um, then we get into the spell list, and I think that you know how you know how a long time ago I did that whole pages of spells experiment. Mm -hmm. I get the, I get the feeling that the if this is any indication, I get the feeling the final version of Driven into Darkness is going to ha is going to be on the low end of that experiment. Especially since, let me. Each of each of the each of the spells is only is the equivalent of one sentence. Yep, it has at the very beginning all of its particulars, dealing with statistics, and then a description. Mm -hmm. Um. What I do. F What I do find in what I do find interesting is is the fa is the fact that the st is the fact that the um the stat well the stat the stat mod is not is not set is not set in stone but. We have twenty-five spells at first tier, so even if you, even if we did that whole all all ones, um, you wouldn't be able you wouldn't be able, I don't think you'd be able to get all of them even at even at a even as a ninth tier caster. Yes, you could. Forty-five mm -hmm. magic points. Tier one spells only cast one magic point per per. Uh... Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. Um, but each... you get all of them in a nice handful of level two, uh, 
of tier two spells. Mm -hmm. But let let me uh, let me do a bit of math so I can see so I can get the total amount of spells. So we have twenty five at first tier, twenty four at second tier. No, twenty five. You're missing. You're 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 missing the. Uh, oh yeah. Very well hidden mm -hmm. warriors of faith spell there. Mm -hmm. uh, twenty one at third. And nineteen at fourth. Thir thirteen. Yeah, thirteen at fifth. Eleven at sixth, and seven at seven at seventh. Seven at seven, eighth, and ninth. And as a ninth, thirty-five spells. And I don't know if that's going to be the complete spell list. This is just a play test, mm -hmm. but. What that means, though, is remember that each as you go up to each tier, you get one free spell from that tier. Yep. So no matter what, you're going to have one of each tier level of spell at ninth. But then you have 45 leftover magic power points. Now, if you really wanted to be some weird... Well, not weird, but probably very, very powerful ninth tier caster, mm -hmm. you could spend... Nine times three, because that's all you... No, no, hold on. Nine times five. Nine times five is 45. Yes. You could you could have six of the seven ninth tier spells if you really wanted to. You'd have the one free one, and then you could spend your 45 magic power points on five more. Mm -hmm. And get things like transcendent forms, time stop, kill, mind melt... Apocalypse, Divine Grace, or Resurrection. Yeah, and of course you can also up you can upcast spells, which increases the target number to cast the spell to the to that tier while increasing their their T spell and R spell mod values at are added by one increased tier. Um, T spell I, mod is your chosen total stat mod to use for spell casting, mm -hmm. and your R spell mod is the raw mod of chosen spell casting stat. Yeah. Um, I, I like mm -hmm. I like the example they use here. If you cast the first level tier or the first tier spell white arrow at ninth tier, increases the T spell mod bonus by eight. With a mm -hmm. T spell mod of eight, the spell deals thirty two damage. Mm -hmm. And of course, and you can't cast spell you can't cast um, point origin or range spells while you're engaged in melee. Um, but is there something other than those two? There's touch. Mm -hmm. There's also caster origin. So anything you, that AOE's around you or anything you can touch works. Point origin is you choose a point that's where it originates. Ranged is obviously ranged. Mm -hmm. So. Anything that requires you to do things further away from, from a distance of yourself. Although you notice what we didn't see in that in that spell in that casting setup. How many times you can cast per day. Mm-hmm. None of that bullshit. Thank God. Um then we get to traits, which I'd like I'd like to say that tra that traits are feats, but um without all without any of the things in feats that piss us off. I mean, there's some there's some degree of prerequisites, but not much. There are a lot of traits in this playtest. Fifty-five general traits, thirty-three 30 spell casting, mm -hmm. and thirty-eight martial. Yeah, and of course, with martial traits, you have to be with martial traits. You have to be martially disciplined, and with spellcaster traits, you have to be able to, to cast at least one spell. Which you know makes sense. If you aren't the things that the trade is named after, you kind of can't do the thing. Mm -hmm. um. I um, I like that one of the traits is just coup de gras. When you succeed mm -hmm. an attack check versus a single human that you damaged in a previous round, you can add your total intelligence or total wisdom to the damage. I don't know why that says and or. That should be or shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, even though this is a value of the judge, trying to go through, going through all of the spells and all of the traits would kind of distract from the point. The point is, is that there is a lot of them, and um, the way the way that they're set up with these with these with the different size with the different text sizes and the like, 
Um, and I had mentioned this in the interview, but I, I keep getting flashbacks to Mork Borg, although this isn't nearly as um, yellow and black. I'd actually like to linger a little bit here on, on the traits just for a few things. Mm -hmm. uh, I pointed out coup de gras. There's actually a really cool end to this. If the attack does not kill the target, you cannot use this trait again until after a full rest. Mm -hmm. That means you can coup de gras so long as it keeps killing things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'd like to point out some of the keys here because there, there are a, little, a few key things that um, are very interesting. There's a key called FCRE, and it stands for on a failed check, the trait activates but then cannot be used again until after full rest. Mm -hmm. So failure means the trait's exhausted. Um, <clears throat> ENR effect lasts until next round, end of next round. Mm-hmm. Critical range, die results that trigger a critical effect. Um, if not expanded or reduced by an effect, a die result of 1 is a critical fail and a 20 is a critical success. Mm -hmm. IRED, only if in range and the attack roll equaled or exceeded the dexterity defense of the new targets. And then roll TN+. Plus. Uh, roll a check versus a target number 10, add plus 1 for each subsequent use then the target number resets to 10 after a full rest. Mm -hmm. This this is an interesting set of keys, because otherwise there isn't really anything in these traits that uses these little tags besides these 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 five. Um, whereas the magic the magic ones, those those key those uh, tags in the key, uh, every spell has a combination of them because they're gonna determine you know your the range. Uh, whether it's a main action, quick action, or free action, whether it's a sustained spell, etc. Yeah, um, and I pr I vastly prefer this to to some short rest or long rest thing. Since I just, you, go ahead. I just I just like the idea of I'm gonna hit this person enough times that I know that if I add my my intelligence or wisdom to the damage next time, they're gonna die. Coup de gras. Mm -hmm. And then move on and do it again. Coup de Gras does not become exhausted unless whatever you're trying to kill does not die. I love it. It's so good. It's so good. Why? It's like Cleave without the bullshit. Yes. <sighs> oh. Of course, with... Ke um... Since we talked about we talked about the possibility of gishes, well, one of the spellcaster traits is magic strike. When you attack with a weapon, you can choose to suffer full spell fatigue to add the spell tier multiplied by five to the damage. If the attack check is a critical failure, causes a spell mishap. Imagine doing that with a um, ninth level spell. <laughs> oh man, that would uh, that that sounds like it would be gross. Especially since uh, something we glossed over earlier, um, having to do with leveling up. Mm -hmm. uh, all characters reach... The, the maximum level is 8. And so it takes 54 total experience to get to, to level 8. And then there's this nice little blurb. If the GM and players are seeking a particular type of game balance, then they can set a limit to the maximum level... Uh, HP, mod uh, HP multiplier, MP, or stats. For example, the players want a more grounded game where the highest level is four. Maximum health modifier and magic points are, are, are or magic, uh, yeah, mag and each stat can only be increased with experience twice. Mm -hmm. uh, on the flip side of this, experience gained after a player character has reached the set max level can still be spent on traits, base HP. Professions, languages, and focuses. Um, I have a, I have an um, just using that little thing alone at the end, just uh, on a normal game going up to level eight, and then just continuing to get XP to give yourself base HP that is insanely high at that point with with a times five multiplier. That's that's a uh, that sounds like fun. Oh, it's cert it certainly does. Although. Um... If I'm if I was running this thing long term, I probably I probably would I probably would not have the level cap at eight. <laughs> you know, it's a case of you keep you keep going until you die. But one but 
Once you bring a new kit, once you bring in a new character sheet, you're not going to be coming. You're not going to be coming back at that high level. So sounds like fun. So much, much like in dark, much like in Dark Cloud, if you've got too many gold, if you've got too much gold, um, buy some bullion. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. But then we get to equipment. So you start with one set of armor if you can if you can use it, one shield if you're strong enough to wield it, and up to four weapons and one roll of provisions, as we mentioned earlier. So armor gives you a minimum bonus to your dexterity defense modifier, which is which is used as a def a defensive deal in response to on incoming attacks. If you're unarmored, your total dex mod is your dexterity de dexterity defense mod. But you get a bonus die when trying to move silently. If you have light armor, your dexterity defense mod is one plus your to your total dex mod to a minimum of plus one. It takes a minute to equip. Heavy armor, your dexterity defense mod is is at is at a minimum of plus two and as high as your total strength mod. You need to have a total strength mod equal to or or exceeding the bonus the armor gives to equip it effectively. Um, takes 10 minutes to equip. It incurs a penalty dice when trying to move silently, obviously. You ever try and sneak in plate? Yes, and it can be done. Fuck anyone who says it can't. I'm sure I'm sure it can be I'm sure it can be done, but I wouldn't call it easy. All, all you do is you stuff um, rags in between the mm -hmm. joints. Yeah, although ev even with even with that, I can understand incurring a penalty die when trying to move silently in fucking plate. I'll have you know that our our Landsknecht, uh snuck up on an enemy encampment and fucking murked them <laughs> in the SDA. Mm -hmm. Doing exactly what I just said by stuffing rags into the joints of our plate mail. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. She shield gives you plus one to plus three to your total to a max of plus three to your total dexterity defense mod. You must have a total strength mod equal to or exceeding the bonus of the shield to use it. It takes a quick action to to equip, i.e. a a plus five total strength heavily armored character with a shield equipped has a total dexterity defense mod of plus eight. Can we punch with the shields? I want to punch with the shields. Uh, doesn't say, doesn't say anything with that, but given the weapon builder, you could probably fig you could probably work work it in there. Um, you start with and carry up to four weapons when attacking. You add your total strength mod to the check, aiming to meet or exceed the target's dexterity defense. If you hit, if you hit the target, you add your total strength to the base damage for the total we total damage dealt. It takes a quick action to unequip and a full and a I think that's supposed to be a free action to drop. Um, let's see, one hand, one handed can be dual wielded, but the offhand weapon's damage is halved. But a we a weapon a one-handed weapon wielded in two hands deals plus one b plus one base damage. Um, two hand two-handed weapons are used in two hands, but you can't cast. Let's see, reach we reach weapons well attacks from attacks a target up to two meters away. Ranged weapons you cannot use them while engaged in melee. They can use a total strength or total dex for attacks and damage. It takes a quick action to reload a ranged weapon. If you choose to shoot a ranged weapon, um, it says minus one's provisions once per full rest. If range is in question, consider that a longbow has a range of over 150 meters, a Chinese crossbow over 250 meters. Line of sight is more the issue when it comes to having a target for your ranged weapon. Longbow is only 150 meters. What fucking drugs are they on? The uh, quintessential medieval longbow, uh, iconic, known as the Welsh or English longbow, was accurate up to 400 yards, and could still punch through your ar armor with a good bodkin. 
How how many yards did you say? Four hundred. That is which is that is three hundred and sixty five point seven six meters. Yes. It's it, it, the Welsh longbow changed the face of medieval fighting in England, mm -hmm. and then in the rest of Europe when England went and said "fuck y'all." Yep. Let's see. Ba balanced weapons add both your total strength and total dex to the weapon's total damage modifier. In addition, total strength or total dex can be used for att for attack checks, i.e., a, mar a martial two-handed balanced weapon with a plus six total. Total dex and a plus five total strength has eleven has plus eleven total added to the weapon's base damage of eight. That just sounds gross. Uh, then we have a weapon builder, which incidentally, stuff like weapon builders is some is something that I think more games need to use. Having a having a li having a list of weapons is nice and all, but we can do both, can't we? Oh. Yes. So weapons start with a base damage of 5 that is then modified by its discipline, size, and optional properties. Martial discipline adds plus 1. Simple discipline, minus 1. Two-handed, plus 2. Or one-handed, minus, minus 1. Uh, let's see. Ranged, minus 2. And or balanced, minus 1. And or unique, and or light, mi minus one, melee open, throw, plus t total dex, or total strength, and or reach, minus one. The minimum is zero. A weapon cannot deal less than its base damage. A unique property is something the GM and player work out together, deciding upon the property's effect and the amount, if any, it subtracts from the weapon's base damage. Um, I like this weapon builder, but if I, c if I can put one bit of advice with this kind of thing... Put in one page dedicated solely to example weapons. Mm -hmm. It's gun. It's go I think it's going to be needed because you need to establish a baseline before you get into the crazy shit. Oh, Let's see. Then we get to provisions. When attempting to acquire provisions, a player rolls plus or minus their total intelligence, wisdom, or charisma. <laughs> Uh, depending on the method that they're using, you start with you start with one roll of provisions. If the provision roll is less than your current provisions, you do not gain any. If you roll above your current provisions, the result of that roll is your new amount. And then there there's a asterisk. Example: two two characters find a turned over cart. They both check to find any useful provisions. One character currently has 14 provisions and rolls their total wisdom and gets a 13. They find nothing useful. The other one has 12 and rolls a 16 total, setting their new current provisions to 16. And if, and if, and if you wanted to roleplay this, you could probably say that the, fir that the first character overlooks some shit. And the second character is like, how could, you, how could you treat this perfectly good apple that's covered in half muck and I could just wa wipe it off my shirt? Now it's good as new. Fuck y'all. <laughs> um. Let's see. Provisions can be purchased for between one to five coins each. A character can only use coins to purchase provisions up to a maximum of twenty. I get the feeling mm -hmm. the one to, the the one to five range is going to be determined by the GM. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you're in if you're in if you're in the if you're in the middle of a decent sized city, I could see it only costing one coin. But if you're a little bit out of the way or on the borderlands, I could see that costing five coins. Yeah. There was also that little bit about provisions are expended whenever a character has to reuse, replenish, or consume an item on their person. Mm -hmm. And the example there is, in the morning, the party consumes two provisions each, eating rations and drinking water. Later, a fight leaves a character's armor damaged. The blacksmith in the group uses a provision to mend it. At night, the party finds the hill Drake's lair. While inside, they use provisions to safely traverse ropes and torches, to quickly heal after fights, health potions, and to make traps behind themselves for any who follow. I don't mind this because it's essentially simplifying a lot of the item busy work. That, yeah, that that can happen in old school play. Pretty good. It also means that you something something that I've that I've advocated, especially especially if somebody sees how I do character creation, is 
A lot of the a lot of the minuscule, you're only going to use this item for one or two things, but there, but we put them here just to add just to try and add verisimilitude. I try and minimize that kind of thing, largely because I feel like the I feel like the i the um, item slots that somebody has should be used for things that are going to actually get well use, not use in this very very specific kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Um. This is why this is also why I'm why I wholeheartedly approve of the move towards kits instead of instead of those individual items. Oh. After that we have lighting and vision. You have four levels of light slash vision. D um dark slash totally obscured, dim slash obscured, bright slash unobstructed, and blinding. Oh, a light source can last from 20 minutes to up to 6 hours. It sheds a gradient of, of light from bright to dim light up to out to 12 meters. Darkness, you, you have to use senses other than sight or memory to overcome an obstacle. Um, dark and totally obscured characters are granted two bonus dice to hiding. All actions that require sight, sight are impossible or, get, or incur two penalty dice. Um, blinding, you are bl you are blind while looking at a source of blinding light, obviously, and the whole it actions that require sight are impossible or have two penalty dice, and hiding is impossible. Um, I mean, could you say hiding is impossible when anyone in the blinding light can't see you to begin with? Yeah, fair, fair <clears throat> enough. Um, you could still traverse by hearing. Let's see, D dim and obscured. It's hard. To, it's hard to read, see color, make out details, and and so on, or distinguish persons from a short distance. Dim slash obscured areas grant a bonus dice to hiding. Actions that require you to to see clearly have a penalty dice. Entities can obscure each other. So, would you say dim and obscured is the uh, constant natural state of being for every gaming journalist? <laughs> See, this is why it won't work at Dicebreaker. Hmm. So, then we have commerce, crafting, and henchmen. At character creation, a character begins with 100 coin per level. They can carry total strength times 100 coin worth of valuables, minimum 100. I appreciate that we're not using that we're not using weight. A character can expend provisions to increase the amount of coin they can carry by 100 per provision spent, although every provision spent in this way incurs a penalty dice to provision checks until the additional coin being carried is left behind, hidden, or banked. What is defined as valuable is up to the GM. And we have a few mid middle-aged items on the, ma on the matter. Spices. Mm -hmm. Spices were worth more than their weight in gold in the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. Especially saffron, which is a spice. Why did you list it separately? <laughs> well, I know why they listed it separately. Saffron, even today, is a spice so insanely hard to get. It is fucking expensive. Oh, yeah. Oh. But then, then, we, have the, then we have the usual stuff with meals. Um, then with buying, we with buying weapons or upgrading heavy armor and shields. Weapons cost 10 coin of base damage, minimum one, minimum 1. Heavy armor and shields can be upgraded at the cost of 100 coin per dexterity defense mod increased. Heavy armor's max dexterity defense is only limited by the wearer's total strength. Shields have a max dexterity defense modifier of plus 3. If a character has a profession that fulfills the role, they can craft weapons and upgrade armor or shields at one quarter the cost. Taking one day per 25 coin spent to upgrade or craft. Uh, then when it comes to the purchasing of crafting cra or, and crafting of one-use magic items. One-use magic items can be purchased from a magically enlightened community at the cost of 100 coin per numerical value of the item. Ergo, a one-use plus two weapon bu buff costs 200 coin to buy. If a character has a profession that fulfills the role of making a particular one-use magic item, 
Then they can craft one at one quarter of the cost, once again taking one day per 25 coin. So a one-use fifth level spell scroll costs 125 coin and five days to craft. Um, what are you What are you doing? Concentrating all of the powers of the universe into the nib of your fucking uh, your, your fucking quill pen? So no, a, I know. a ninth le a ninth level spell scroll would cost 220. If you were, if would either cost nine hundred if you were getting it at a shop, or two hundred. Are we now? We now when they, I think this needs to be clarified. When it says one quarter of the cost, are we talking twenty five percent off or twenty five percent total? Twenty five percent total. One hundred and twenty five or one hundred and twenty five coin is is uh twenty five percent of five hundred coin. All right. Um. So with it, with a ninth le a ninth level spell scroll, that's going to cost two hundred and twenty five coin, and take nine days to to craft. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see. For reusable magic items, they cannot be purchased in general. If they do change hands, it is at secret auctions or paid as compensation for great favors done on the behalf of monarchs. If a character has a profession that fulfills the role of making particular reusable magic items, they can craft them at the cost of 1,000 coin per numerical value of the item, taking one week per 100 coin spent to craft. <laughs> so, a, so that plus two that plus two weapon buff costs, if it's reusable, costs 2,000 coin and 20 weeks to craft. So if you want to craft a reusable apocalypse uh um, scroll, it's 9,000 coin and 90 weeks. Almost two years to craft it. <laughs> uh, let's see, then when it comes to selling magic items, a magic item can be sold to a, bu to a buyer in a wealthy and magically enlightened community. Well, yeah, because if you're selling an apocalypse scroll, nobody in, a, nobody in, a, in the D in it and, and most castles are going to be able to afford that shit. Tell me your kingdom, asshole. What? <laughs> um, the character selling the item rolls a total charisma check versus a TN of 10. The results of the roll represents the, va the value of the sale in increments of 10%. Ergo, a character attempts to sell an item worth 100 coin. If they roll a 6, they sell the item for 60% of its value, 60 coin. If they roll 22, they sell the item for 220% of its value. Sounds like uh, a way to abuse coin. This, sound, this, sounds, this sounds perfect for those diplomats who want to try and, um, want, want to try and be merchants. I wonder if there's a merchant profession. Well, give, given how freeform professions are in this set in this setup, probably I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bonuses to negotiating for selling for selling shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to sell you this scroll, this reusable scroll of apocalypse, my lord. What? Yes, its bidding starts at five hundred thousand coin. Oh, by the way, this is an auction. <laughs> Oh. 500,000 coin? That's the GDP of my fucking kingdom. <laughs> well, then I guess it's worth a king's ransom, isn't it? <laughs> and that, then you give him an idea and he goes, to he goes to ransom off a neighboring king to get the coin for it. <laughs> and now I am building it. <laughs> I've built it, Bunk. I've already built a character. Guess what his name is. <sighs> I'm afraid to ask. His name is Rickolas Cage, the Lord of War. <laughs> <laughs> he is a merchant of death. And all he does is make reusable magic scrolls and sell them for exorbitant prices to watch kingdoms eat each other. <sighs> I'm an asshole. Yes, you are. 
<laughs> it takes one to know one. <laughs> I'm glad you can admit you're one too. Anyway, then hiring henchmen. Characters can attempt to hire a henchman by rolling a, to a total stat check. The stat used is dependent on, on what the faction they are attempting to hire them would value most. The result of which is the possible number of henchmen they can take on. Henchmen cost one coin per level per stint to keep d on during an adventure. Ergo, it costs 630 coin to keep on 14 level 5 henchmen on for nine, for nine consecutive stints. A stint is a negotiated period of time at the end of which payment is owed. A stint can be as little as one day and as long as three months. Hench are run as Horde, we'll get to that later, that the player paying them controls. As long as henchmen are being paid for the time they have, suffi they have sufficient provisions for food, water, and shelter. Good, so you don't have to do busy work with them. Henchmen are equipped and have traits that fit the identity and resources of the faction they are being hired from. To keep them easy to run, have a horde of henchmen possess up to two to four traits and have them all be equipped with the same equipment. Ergo, the Blue Saber Mercenary Company uses light armor and dual blades. Eight level one Blue Saber Mercs have the dual wielder and dual parry traits. You better not be thinking of hiring the Band of the Hawk. Why would Rickolas Cage hire the Band of the Hawk? He's going to hire the Kalashnikov Compact. <laughs> <sighs> and, anyway, then we get to the action. Then we get to the action setup, and this is where we're getting into the nitty gritty. So, each character in combat has one main action, one move action, one quick action, and infinite free actions. I would assume that free actions are infinite. Yep. Otherwise, they're not free. Mm -hmm. So, main, a main action, main for things that you would think it would be for, attacking, casting spells, can be traded for a move or quick action. Movement, you ha default move speed is 6 meters. That movement can be traded for a quick action. Quick actions are used for more specific actions, such as drawing or reloading a weapon, picking up or interacting with, o with objects, activating abilities, traits, or casting some spells, and cannot be traded. Um, and free actions are used for defense checks and some special abilities. They are referenced to clarify the, that the specific action being taken uses none of the above action types and is instead done freely. I am I am per I am perfectly fine with I'm perfectly fine with this approach. It does remind me of fourth edition's action economy and that it and that they did the same trade down system that I ended up using myself back in those days. Yeah. So with sta with standard actions, you have the ti you have the time actions take, which is based on the pace of a scene and the result of a check. Um this t this <coughs> Types of scene pace include combat pace, dungeon pace, and journey pace. A critical success takes a quick action in combat, a a movement in dungeon, and one hour main action. In, main, main action one hour and one hour in journey, with an additional positive effect. A success takes a main action in in combat, one minute in dungeon, and and six hours in journey. A fail still completes the task, but it takes two main actions in in combat, ten minutes in dungeon, and twelve hours in journey. A critical fail takes the same amount of time as a fail, but there is an unintended negative consequence. So we do have a bit of fail forward here. Oh. That's good. Mm -hmm. But also... Um... Gives more incentive to use that uh, comeback die rule. Yep. Since a fail isn't just an outright you you fail and suck and this can't be done period, but is instead you just take more time to do thing which can be very bad. <clears throat> and a crit fail is you is you know you take more time to do thing plus there's some negative shit that comes with it. Mm -hmm. That's a that's an interesting set of actions. I like it. Or a set of times, I should say. Yep. Let's see. Next is stealth and hiding. When you use your main action to attempt to hide, you make a stat check. 
which the TN is equal to 10 plus the total wisdom of the most perceptive opponent, plus, ha plus half the total number of opponents that are on the lookout. A to a maximum of plus 8. Mm -hmm. A successful check during combat has a character become hidden at the end of the action phase if they are not directly adjacent to an opponent and are within an obscured or totally, or totally obscured area. A character hidden in an obscured area gets a bonus to defense checks, and their targets incur a penalty to defend versus their effects. If they're totally obscured, they have twice the effect of obscured. In addition, they can only be targeted if the GM declares that the opponent will retaliate versus the hidden attacker. If the player then attacks, they will, bec they will become the target. Hidden entities are revealed if they attack, cast a spell, or, or intercept others. I wonder if, when we passed spellcasting feats earlier, I wonder if there are traits, excuse me, um, if, if there's a trait that allows you to spellcast without being discovered, like one that's silent casting. I'll have to look a bit later. Um, next is climbing, jumping, and swimming, which is fairly standard. Um, then helping others, you can spend time, You you if a character is engaging in an action, another character can spend their time helping to grant a bonus dice. If the help given is related to the shared connection between characters, the help grants an additional bonus die. You cannot help another if the helper has a negative mod in the stat being used, or if the action is being done as part of the other character's profession and the helping character doesn't have a compatible one. Let's see, then we get to defensive actions. So you have defense... Defensive free actions. Rolling for defense is a free action done when done when being threatened. You only roll once during the phase, and that and that's and that's used for for checks. First, we have defense checks. This is rolled as a free action in response to all incoming attacks, spells, and other harmful effects. The TN for a defense check is ten plus the total stat being used by the attack attacking opponent. You only roll one defense check for all effects during the phase, and adding the appropriate modifiers to that single roll for any oncoming spells, attacks, and other effects. Let's see, dexter dexterity defense, which we've talked about when we talked about armor, gives you a minimum bonus to your dexterity defense modifier. This is added to defense checks versus oncoming, at oncoming attacks and so on that we mentioned. I do no I do notice the lack of um saving throws, which um, I don't personally mind. Let's see, then we get to critical successes or fit or failures. Critical range if it is basic is the standard. Twenty twenty is a crit, one is a one is a botch. A critical success on a dexterity defense check causes the character to take no damage. A critical fail causes them to take one and a half total damage, and causes a causes a piece of defensive equipment to suffer damage, i.e., minus one on that dexterity defense bonus. A critical success on a stat def on a stat defense ch check causes the character causes the character to take no damage, or or once again, uh, damage and a half. Something you forgot to mention about mm -hmm. critical successes on dex defense check. Mm -hmm. There was that last bit of about if applicable, it also damages or breaks the opponent's weapon. <laughs> that would be that'd be funny with that would be funny for somebody who wants to go full tanky. No damage, dex defense crit. Oh, um, yeah, your sword. That's not a sword anymore. It's now a really jagged and broken dagger. Have fun. It'd also be funny as hell if, the, if that ends up happening with somebody getting shot with arrows. <coughs> Just break the arrows. Mm -hmm. Um. Or even, <laughs> or even worse, if somebody ha if somebody has a um. Somebody has Greek fire thrown at them, <laughs> and they crit. I'm pretty but sure. That's it does say only if it's a, a applicable breaks mm -hmm. or damages so a, a, the opponent's weapon. Yeah, that wouldn't be that wouldn't be applic that wouldn't be applicable, but it'd be funny. Catch it, catch the vial while it's still going in midair. Mm -hmm. No damage, and now I have a vial of Greek fire. Goodbye. <laughs>
Um, let's see, then defensive main actions, defensive stance, gain a bonus die to all defense checks. Um, quick actions, reader. Quick. The quick action we have is redirect. Once per instance of damage, a character can choose to have their armor and or shield reduce the damage by the bonus it gives to their dexterity defense. This can be reduced to a minimum of one. So yeah. So a shield is not just a static modifier. And it says here, um, a character with plus eight heavy armor and a plus three shield reduces an instance of fourteen damage by eleven. Suffering only three damage. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good quick action to use. Yep. Now, granted, you're only you only <sighs> get you're only get you're only getting a one quick action per only one quick action per round, but that is still pretty damn useful. Mm -hmm. Um. Then we get to offensive actions. And when you do this, you only roll once for all actions during this during the phase. An instance of an instance of damage is the combined damage value dealt by a single entity or single horde. So, let's first get to weapon attacks. That is a d20 adding your total strength or total dex for light, ranged, and balanced versus the target's dexterity defense. If you succeed, deal the base da deal the base damage plus total strength or total dex for light and ranged weapons or both total str strength and total dex combined for balanced. For un for unarmed, you roll you roll adding your raw your raw strength versus the target's dexterity defense. If you succeed at you at using one at using one hand, deal your unarmed ob slash object base damage default one plus raw strength. If using both hands, add half your base damage again to the total damage. A pommel, A pommel or shield, shield counts as an object. So you can shield punch. Woo! Yep. Let's see. Restra restrain. So this is going to be our grapple rules. It's a main action with a free hand roll adding total strength versus the target's strength defense or dexterity defense. If successful, the target cannot move and has a penalty to dexterity defense. If the target wants to escape, it must con contest using a main action to make a total strength check versus the restrainer's total strength check. If the restrained moves or teleports, the restrainer also moves. So you're dragged with them. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Sho then shove. Roll to main, main roll total strength versus the target's strength defense. If successful, the target is thrown back one meter or is tripped, incurring a penalty to dexterity, def dexterity defense and having movement until... End uh, of round. Mm-hmm. End of next round, excuse yeah. me. And then we get to the concept of this simultaneous combat flow. Well, I think before we do that, we should probably get to the casting spells and the yeah. critical failures. And yeah, successes. let's get to let's get to that first. It's it's a bit of a habit of re of reading the columns like that. Yeah, uh, these are sectioned and columned, and so we got to be a little careful. Mm-hmm. So, uh, casting a spell against a target. When making a spell casting check, page 25, the caster is aiming to equal or exceed the target's stat defense. If successful, the spell works as normal. If the check on a ranged spell fails, the target defends, causing no damage or effect. If the check on any other spell fails, the target defends, causing all numerical values of the spell to be halved. In addition to having conditions, penalty dice and or forced movement have no effect. Mm -hmm. So... If you're doing just a ranged attack spell, they can take no damage. But if you're doing uh, point origin, uh, character origin, or touch, it just halves the values. Uh, then we get to offensive critical successes and failures. Um, same same rules same rules for threat range applies. A critical success on an attack or spell check causes the target to take. 1.5 damage, healing, and or modifier buffs, debu slash debuffs. If applicable, break the target's shield or armor. So, the opposite of our tanky guy, we um, imagine having somebody with a, with a, with, who, who, who is a, who is a crit, who is a crit fisher, who, who says, oh, you, oh, that, oh, that's, that's some nice armor you got. It'd be, a, it'd be a shame if somebody broke it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
A, crit a critical fail causes your weapon to suffer damage. A damaged weapon can be repaired during a partial rest by a professional at the cost of one provision. A critical fail on a spell check causes the spell to have no effect, cause only a mishap. Causing only a mishap. And, and then there's a, mm -hmm. a section about creative offensive actions. Mm -hmm. uh, if a player intends a particular outcome with their action, such as disarming a target or plucking out an eye, the GM could ask that player also use their character's quick action or movement, or increase the to uh, target number of the action, in order to add the desired outcome to the action. If a player attempts the same creative action in the same short of span of time, consider giving the character's opponents a bonus to defense as they are now anticipating such an attack. Mm -hmm. So it's the called shot rules, except better. Yeah. Well, then we get to, once again, the simultaneous combat flow, which is, it, which is a three-step process. Step one, surprise. Step two, action phase. And step three, move phase. And step four, opponent morale. Yep. Um, and the, so then first we determine who's surprised and char characters who are surprised are not part of the first round and have a penalty to all defense checks so start the ambush um, then the action phase spellcasters roll sustained checks the GM announces the opponent's intentions to inform which players will need to defend all players declare their actions and then resolve, roll to resolve them while simultaneously rolling defense versus any offensive actions targeting them, in addition to any ongoing effects such as fear. When we get to the move phase, leftover main actions are traded for movement. The GM announces the opponent's intended paths. The players declare their paths. Both sides then move. The players rolling total strength to intercept opponents or rolling total strength or total dex to resist being intercepted when opposing paths cross. And then lastly, oppo opponent morale. When the opponents lose a leader, suffer a powerful blow, or drop to one half or one quarter strength, they roll for morale v with total charisma or total whiz versus a TN of 15 to 25 based on who has the upper hand. If the opponents fail, they gain the fear condition. If they f fail while feared, they surrender. And then we have a list of conditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, on fire slash bleeding takes X damage at the beginning of each round until a main uh, a main action check is used to stop the effect. Mm -hmm. Poisoned penalty to all checks until the poison is removed. Uh, fear penalty on all checks until you defend versus the fear effect. The source of fear is gone, or an ally makes a total charisma check as a quick action. Paralysis cannot functionally use the body parts that are paralyzed. Stunned can only take one action of any type until the end of the next round, including free actions. Wow. At that point, if you use your free action, you can't use anything else. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's bad. Uh, restrained. Penalty to dex defense and cannot move. Main action check to escape. Tripped. Penalty to dex defense and movement halved. So restrained and tripped we saw with, with mm -hmm. shove and restrain earlier, but the rest are all new. So... Morale drop to fear, and then morale drop again to surrender, apparently. Mm-hmm. Wow. See, then we have a bit more on simultaneous combat, which is segmented into round, rounds with two phases, the action and move phase, which we are, which we already already um, covered. Um, but there's a few other bullet points in this part. Bonuses and, po and positive modifier buffs are effective immediately. And penalties and negative modifier debuffs come into effect at the start of the next phase. And da damage and health gain take effect as soon as they are applied in, in the order of lowest value instance to the highest. If healing and damage happen simultaneously, the damage is prioritized over the effect that restores health. I wonder if that if that means that if in the same phase somebody got brought down to zero HP and then he and then healed. Would that mean that they di that they died and came back? Does zero HP kill? We'll probably find out in a minute. Let's see, then in interception. Characters and, and opponents can intercept each other as a free action when their movement paths cross, or if one pa if one's path crosses with the other's static location. If the character wishes to 
resist being intercepted, they roll a total dex or total strength check versus the opponent's total strength. If the character succeeds, they reach their desired location while the opponent ends their move at the point of interception. If the character fails, they are stopped in the path adjacent to the point of interception. We And we have a nice little example with this of um, grid mo on grid movement. Um, mm -hmm. Although the whole idea of mapping out the routes and then having them all play out I'm being reminded way too much of, of, of say, of say the plays in a, in a football coach's notebook. I'm being reminded of playing Transistor. That works too. Um, although, for, although fortunately, there's an alternative for just moving with thumbs um, with zones. Um. If you're close, you can attack with any melee weapon. You can't attack with ranged weapons or throw a light weapon. And you can't cast ranged or point origin spells. If you're near, you can you can only attack with reach melee weapons and with thrown or ranged weapons. You can target an entity with a spell or ability that has a range of two or more meters. If you're far, you can only attack with weapons with the ranged or thrown property. You can target an entity with a spell or ability that has a range of six or more meters. And if you're distant, you can only attack with weapons that are ra ranged or throw, and you can target an entity with a spell or ability of, with a range of 12 or more. So, if you're using zones, it's good to be an artillery caster. Mm -hmm. You can't get close to me! Have a fireball! And speak, speaking, of, speaking of whether... Z and we, the question that you asked earlier, it's already answered on the next page. Yep. When a character falls to zero health or below, they suffer a mortal wound, reducing the character's base health by one to a minimum of minus eight. Because minus eight kills you. Mm -hmm. Until after the next full rest. While a character is suffering from a mortal wound at zero health or less, they have a penalty die to all checks, persisting so long as the character health remains at zero or less. Penalties for mortal or grievous wounds come into effect until don't come into effect until the next phase. If a mortally wounded character takes damage, they roll two d20 on the grievous wounds table, adding or subtracting one from the roll each time the damage value would exceed the mortally wounded characters, um, or mortality wounded characters typo max health. Add one. Add one if. Add if the roll is 21 or more. Subtract if the roll is 20 or less. There you go. A character with 3 max health takes an instance of 13 damage while mortally wounded. They roll 2d20 with a modifier of plus 4 if the roll is 21 or above. And, or plus or minus 4 if the roll is 20 or less. And the and the setup the setup with these is pretty nasty. The entire grid, a grievous wound reduces an R stat. Mm -hmm. And remember, an R stat, when reduced to neg eight, will kill you. Um, each point on the grid uh, is minus something to certain position R stat. Uh, a, a one on this grid, uh, which you could only get if you had the negative modifier, uh, would be minus four to your lowest R stat. So if you were playing the heavily unbalanced version of arrays where it's three stats at plus four and three stats at minus four and you got that grievous wound, you're dead. Mm -hmm. Period. End of story. And it goes up that grid like that all the time. Uh, minus four to lowest R stat for one through one to two and then minus three for three to four. Minus two, five, six, or five, six, and seven. Minus one for eight, nine, and ten. And then on the next row, it's to the second lowest R stat. On the third row, it's to the second highest R stat. And on the last row, uh, it's the highest R stat. So mm -hmm. if you're lucky, it'll be to your highest stat that you'll get a huge kick in the nuts. <laughs> if you're unlucky, It'll be to your lowest stat that you'll get a huge kick of nuts, potentially just killing you. Yeah, this this particular approach of of directly da of directly damage of um your wounds being tied being tied to ability scores, I am getting traveler flashbacks. 
I'm not, I'm sorry. There's not enough death in character creation for that. No, but no, but there is death. <laughs> and to think, people were say, people were saying on, people were saying on the server that we that that you should that you should use Traveler for a Cowboy Bebop RPG. <laughs> how, uh, ma how many uh, how many times has how many times has Spike take taken bullets that should have killed him and didn't? Twice. The third time is what got him. Mm -hmm. So I guess third time's the charm. Or in some, or in some in some cases just ri just ridiculous amount of amount of luck. <laughs> um, well, but it t yep. it a full rest reduces one point of each raw stat. So so if you if you ended up get, if you ended up getting that mi that minus four ass kicking, um, you'd you'd be you'd be bedridden for four di for for four days to try and get it back. Um. Well, it it actually depends. There's a little section about the time it takes to rest. Mm -hmm. uh, the time resting takes is abstracted to suit the pace of the game. <laughs> Example one, in a day-to-day -day city adventure, the GM could say, due to the pace, a partial rest is one hour and a full rest is seven. Example two, during a long journey through the environment where the pace is long and potential combat encounters only happen every odd day or so, the GM could say that a partial rest completes each restful night of the journey, and a full rest completes after the first week of travel. Uh, example three, within a dungeon where the pace is fast and combat is frequent, the GM could say that due to the heightened state of the character, the, st the characters, a partial rest is ten minutes and a full rest is an hour. So it's abstracted depending on situation. Uh, personally, I think a grievous, a grievous wound that fucks fucks minus four to any of your stats um that's like how do i say this that's a huge amount of um of grievous wounds to heal and uh full rests are we are um, made up of several partial rests, it says here. Mm -hmm. But four full rests to re to restore the neg four that you took, I could see that being four days, or maybe just rounded off as a week. One week is is enough full rests to to restore the neg four you took. Mm-hmm. Now, hang on a second. Okay. I have a perils of the warp table. <laughs> um, so then we get to spell cast. Then we get to the way spell casting works proper, and this is and this is why I skimmed it earlier. So first off, you choose one mental stat mod as your total spell modifier. I like that. I like that. Um, so the the spell t the spell types we have caster origin. So targets within 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 cer within certain num within X meters refer, i.e., an area with a radius of the size which originates from you. So your whether that wh sometimes that might be a, sometimes that might be a cone some. Um, and so, and sometimes it might be sometimes it might be a line. Um, point origin, a point within X meters, refer, i.e., the location that will be an origin point for an area of effect. So your so your ranged area, your ranged AOE, or your personal AOE, ranged spell, self-explanatory, touch, also self-explanatory. See, def when it comes to defending against spells. The affected character rolls a stat defense check. The TN is 10 plus the relevant total stat mod of the opponent creating the effect. I.e., to defend from a dragon's fire roll, it's it's a roll. The the TN is 10 plus the dragon's total constitution. Oh, 
If the character's defense fails, the spell effect works as normal. If the defending character succeeds versus a ranged spell, it causes no damage or effect. All other spells have their numerical values halved. In addition to having conditions, penalty dice, and or forced movement have no effect. And targets under a spell's effects attempt to defend the same round a, a sustained roll for that spell is made. So if you're sustaining this giant AoE cage of fire, you're going to have to keep rolling against your sustain mm -hmm. to de try and defend. Yep. So then, now when it comes to spell casting checks, first off, you need to have a free hand. Um, the TN to avoid a mishap is 10 plus the tier being cast. Each time a spell is cast at a, gi at a given tier, the TN to cast spells with that tier increases by 1, which represents your level of fatigue. Only roll once, even if you are casting more than one spell. Casting the spell multiple times in one phase incurs a penalty die for each identical spell cast. This gives me some evil ideas with that first level white arrow spell. Exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. To sustain a spell, you roll a spell casting check as a free action at the start of the action phase or every 10 minutes versus a target number of 10 plus the spell's tier and level of fatigue. On a success, the spell continues. On a, fail on a failure, the spell ends with no, mis with no mishap. Targets under the spell's effects attempt to defend the same round the sustain roll is made. You cannot cast a spell that you're already sustaining. I should hope not. Mm -hmm. um, the I This idea of cast until you're tired reminds me of Slayer's D20. Although the although the systems for it are not are not in any way the same. But I've I've always preferred I've always preferred that kind of method in these in these approaches because the the whole oh you can only cast a certain number of spells of e of each level each to eight between eight hour rests for as for for as much as people like to argue otherwise I always found that to be a bit too gamist mm -hmm. especially when you consider especially when you consider that the argument is always that um, additions that use that approach. Have, are trying to have a very poorly understood attitude when it comes to spe when it comes to spells. So how does a caster know that they can only cast they can only cast that fireball once a day? Yeah, how do they know whether they're exhausted or not? And before anyone brings up appendix N, don't. I don't care about I don't care about the in I don't care about the inspirations. I only care about what's in the friggin' book. If it ain't in the book. It's it's much like it's much like the die that rolled off the table. If it didn't roll on the table, it doesn't happen. If it's not in the book, it doesn't exist. Oh. And anyway, then we have upcasting spells, so you can ca casting lower level spells at higher tiers. This increases the TN to cast the spell to that tier. While increasing the to the total spell the total spell, and um, and raw, raw and, spell and raw spell mod values added to the spell, by one for each increased tier. Ergo, casting the first tier spell ele elemental blast at ninth tier increases its T spell mod and its R spell mod values by eight, making the size of the cone twelve meters, and the da and the damage to twenty seven. Yep. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Spe um, spell critical successes and failures. A critical success does damage does damage in a half or or healing in a half or hand in a half for for buffs and debuffs. If applicable, break the opponent's shield or armor. Imagine imagine someone using um element the that ninth level elemental blast in order in order and. Not not just melting someone's shield, but just turning it into splinters. <laughs> or do, or <laughs> or or hell, why is why does it have to be fire? Why not ha why not have it as ice? 
Then your then your armor and shield are just are just shredded from millions of ice shards. You would choose ice. Yes, I would. I'm the ice dragon. <laughs> I'm gonna make your metal turn into metal so that you can uh, die while you die. I don't know. I was coming up with something there. <laughs> um. So. Um, Turn everybody's metal armor on the on the field into berserker armor without the benefits of the berserker armor. Well, so so it just so so it just spikes them. Yes, very much so. Let's see. So sustaining multiple spells and damage while sustaining. If you're sustaining more than one spell at the start of an action phase, roll one penalty die for each additional spell sustained. When you make the sustain check with multiple spells, roll once for all spells. If you took damage in the previous round, add one penalty die to sustain checks. Example, a character is sustaining a first, third, and fifth tier spell at the start of the action phase. They roll with two penalty dice, getting a 12 total. The third and fifth tier spell effects end, but the first tier spell effect is, is sustained, remaining active for the round. And the casting spells while engaged, we already covered that. Then we get to spell mishaps and spell fatigue. Hold on. Oh, go ahead. I'd just like to point out mm -hmm. that with the sustain rules, it's going back to old concentration rules where you can concentrate as many sustain spells as you want to. Oh, you can do as many as you want to. It's just going to get harder and harder to do it. Nonsense, puppycock. I have a five-track mind. <laughs> Don't you mean an eight-track mind? Who needs eight tracks? Never mind. So, then we have spell mishaps and spell fatigue. If you roll below the target number to avoid a mishap, the spell casts as normal, but with an unintended consequence called a spell mishap. This mishap incurs full spell fatigue, which causes the caster to lose the ability to cast a spell with the tier or tiers being cast until from, from the cast until you finish a full rest. To determine the type of mishap, roll 2d20 on the mishap table and apply the effects. The caster can choose to ignore the mishap and the full spell fatigue. Although each time they choose to ignore a mishap, they add one extra d20 to the next mishap roll. If the caster reaches three extra d20s, they are forced to roll the next time one of their spells causes a mishap. And this is where we effectively have a Perils of the Warp day. <laughs> I like... I like, uh, I like 61 plus. You and everything within one kilometer roll target number 20 plus spell tier con defense or be disintegrated, minced, melted, or petrified. Um, My mishap is I nuke everything! The... The way, the way spell casting works and the, and the way the spell mishap table works... It's very it it seems to turn spellcasting into a into a game of chicken. Yeah. I uh, so we, even if you only have a few spells, there's a lot of variety that you can do with the even if you just have one spell, white arrow. There's a lot of variety in what you can in what you can do and how you can use it. But it's a case of how of how far are you willing are you willing to push your luck? Some of these mishaps. Some of these mishaps aren't even like some of these mishaps aren't even bad. Thirty-one. You lose all sensation for twenty-four hours. You do not receive the penalties from having a mortal wound. Oh, which it, which is nice and all, but remember, but remember, when once you once you go through the once you go through the um, once you go through the mishap, you can't cast that tier again. Until you rest up. Yep. I, I like this one as well. 24. Choose a color. All light is tinted at that color within one plus spell tier kilometers. This is definitely this definitely feels like Perils of the Warp. But then again, it he, is. He did he did state Wrath and Glory as one of his inspirations, so it fits. <laughs> you temporarily lose the ability to blink, speak. Ball up your fist, look someone in the eye, touch your face, walk through do doorways, and or remember anyone's name. What? I th 
I think the one that's even better is the one that run right after that, number 30. You, you, forget, forget. <laughs> you forget where you are and what you are doing. You believe any explanation to your questions. I could see again? that getting abused if the B if the B bag has a um, spell mishap. Like yeah. imagine the big imagine the big bad necromancer botching his spells and then rolling a thirty on mishap. <laughs> yeah. And um, like I just <laughs> all of your hair disintegrates. It does grow back. Um. Although I'd, I suppose one of the more embarrassing ones, especially if you're especially if you're casting for some display in public, would be number thirty-four. Cloth, hemp, silk, and leather equipment within spell tier meters is destroyed by an elemental effect. Those wielding clothes of those materials take one plus spell tier damage. Taking the damage would be bad enough, but the worst part is um. Now everybody's naked. Yeah. And all, and they've lost all their equipment. Mm -hmm. You can hear everyone's thoughts within 100 meters. Or everyone can hear your thoughts within 100 meters. Fucking Christ! Uh, <laughs> also, I think, I think it's safe to say that number 18, I'm calling the noisy cricket mishap. Thrown back one plus spell tier meters. <laughs> um. There are some really bad ones here, like um, the ones that get rid of provisions, or the ones that severely dehydrate everybody. What about twenty six? <laughs> Your voice becomes five times louder for twenty four hours. Hey. Hey, there's a there's a uh, there's a boon to that. You could do ASMR for an entire village in the middle of the night. Um, if I if that if that ended up happening to one of my characters, I actually here how's how's this for an evil idea? A a spellcasting bard whose instrument is yodeling. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> that that'll keep that'll keep the entire village awake. A part of your body turns into a mineral slash metal. So wait a minute. King Midas, is that you? Nope, it's king nope, unfortunately it's King Diamond. Hey, 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 you're funny. Let's see. Then we have creating and ru and running opponents, um, which is ba is basically basically the gu the guide for creating um for for, cre for creating N NPCs, MOOCs, and the like. It also has a description for horde combat. Mm -hmm. For a horde, co a horde is a group of opponents of the same type in a combat encounter. And they add half a horde's number, max of plus eight, to checks of combined effort. If multiple horde members of the same type are in range to attack a character, have the TN to defend versus them increase by half the number of attackers. Um, what, using the weapon damage of the majority of attackers, claw four damage. You add a value equal to half the number of successful attacks to the damage total of a horde's combined attack. Ergo, eight claw attacks hit de hit dealing four plus four for eight total damage. For spell casting hordes, add half their numbers to the TN to def to defend versus the spell and to its damage. Imagine hiring imagine hiring a bunch of mages, and then ha and then having the and then having them multicasting. We're gonna make you regret your day, <laughs> unless we miss half, in which case we might regret our day too. Mm-hmm. Let's see. A lot. There's there's certainly a lot of that whole um, add ha add half. Opo when it comes to 
targeting a horde. When fighting hordes in melee, a character can target any number of members within their reach during the phase. If using a ranged or thrown weapon attack, characters can target up to four members that are all adjacent to each other. If using an ability that increases their number of attacks, they can choose to have each attack target a different set of four members that are all adjacent to each other. Range spells target a number of members equal to the spell's max targets. Ergo, a ninth tier magic user casts magic arrows at ninth tier, targeting 12 horde members. Spells and abilities with a AoE target all within their area. Pretty sure that was, I think that was self-explanatory. Well, there might be people who don't know what the fuck AoE means. Yeah. <laughs> which is which is which is certainly true. But I do I do I do like the set the setup for these um for these horde sheets. Especially yeah. especially the descriptors like with the flesh thrall warrior. Blade, bow, skeletal, twitchy, scabby, brain dead, half blind mm -hmm. and repellent. Set it on fire. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then we have unique opponent traits and unique opponent weaknesses. Unique opponents are our named characters that we fight. Mm -hmm. Although I like, I like that one of the unique weaknesses is predict predictable. Predictable. Mm-hmm. And then we have a simplified opponent creation setup. Step one, establish type. We have minion, elites, mini boss, and boss. Then the target numbers and their modifiers. The base mod of each opponent is set by their type. This mod increases by one for e each level up to a set maximum. Levels determined by the average character level. The current dungeon layer or another appropriate modifier such as weeks traveled away from a safe settlement or where the gang sits in the city's criminal hierarchy. If you want more variability from each stat, you can randomly determine weaknesses, minus four from from mod, and focuses, minus two, minus two to mod, by rolling a d20 for each stat. On an odd result, the stat is a weakness. On an even result, it's a focus. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Then establish health. Max health is determined by multiplying the opponent's level by ten, if that number is then multiplied, halved, or quart that num that number is then multiplied, halved, or quartered by the opponent's type adjustment, i.e., times two or one quarter. Lastly, add the type's additional value. Then establish damage. The damage the opponent deals when it overcomes the player's defense is that opponent's level adjusted by type. That num that number is then increased by the opponent's additional value, i.e., i.e., a mini boss damage is. Level 6 times 2 equals 12, then 12 plus 10 for 22 damage. Uh, and then and we have a simplified encounter table, rolling 2d20 for every 10 minutes in a dungeon or 12 to 48 hours on the road. On a 2 to 12, a patrol of, a patrol of minions. On a 13 to 24, a mini boss. On a 15 to 34, a unit of, a unit of minions. On thir on 35 to 38, a boss leading a patrol, and on 39 to 40, a boss leading a unit. And so that that's a simplified version of random encounter of random encounter tables. Yeah. Uh, which I'm per I'm perfectly fine with. Then we have the we have what looks like a premise slash object um role setup. Which I I can see this being used to to kind of set up um set up what the what the target actually wants. Uh, then dungeon generation tables. Oh boy. <laughs> so we begin with a value of one to ten, representing the representing the amount of entrances into the initial dungeon layer. Choose one of the entrance paths and drop roll two d twenty in the center in the center of a page. Uh, though I do I do like the um, the chart that we have here of some of some of the rooms. Um, we also have a treasure table and cursed treasure. 
Does that not surprise it? me. Mm -hmm. Then a encounter generation table, which we already we already talked about for every t every ten minutes, as well as um, traps, advice on scaling encounters, and encounter flavor. Um, then reactions, time of day, and trinkets. What what is the t what it? Roll, rolling a d20 for what is the time of what is the time of day as well as as well as trinkets a lot of these come off as um things for the G things to bail out the dm might be mm -hmm. and survival navigation in winter I, I how long you how long you can how long you can survive as well as what the weather is like um I can put. Well, you already you already know you already know how I can summarize the weather where I come from. <laughs> see, then we have I a do. a setup for mapping areas, so it's nice to it's nice to see some proper support for hex crawling. Um, the last thing is G, is GM advice and procedure. Um, As well as well as how you as well as some advice to set to set up um, some some archetypes, uh. which to be quite honest the the archetype setup things, I feel I feel like these should be in the character creation section of the full book. I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna raise a fuss if they're not, but that's where I would have put it personally. Maybe split it up this way for aesthetic reasons. Who knows. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and lastly, we have the we have we have the character sheet. Actually, not lastly. In the then we have um so um solo or co-op play, which, as well as some alternate or hard mode hard mode rules, with including a simplified spell mishap table, simplified grievous runes, and hard mode rules for when you want the game to be more perilous, as if it isn't perilous enough as it is. And the final few pages are on the Divine Egg um, module. Oh boy. And and a bunch and a lot of um, summaries for for what we've seen. This is and fi and finally the and finally a bit a ba a back cover. Um. I know, I know, we skimmed through a lot of it, but there, but even though this thing is forty-six pages long, every page is packed with a lot of detail. Not very not info to, dense. Not enough to be exhaustive, but it is go it is going to be dense. Yep, very very info dense. Um, and because. Because of that, because of that, with the full book, with the full book, I would recommend um, putting putting in some quick reference material for both players and DMs. Possibly making a cheat sheet PDF on 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 the website or on Drive Through RPG when this comes out. Um, and bookmarks. Oh lots yeah, and lots of bookmarks and an index. Yep, need both of those. Having a table of contents is not enough. Unless, unless you either a make it a very exhaustive table of contents, or b put hyper put hyperlinks. Um, the fragged games do hyperlinks. They don't really, they don't do an, they don't do an index. They just do bookmarks and and a bunch of hyperlinks all over the place, which is why I give which is why I give um, that particular series a pass. Yeah. Um. But so, but um, I look I look at this I look at this as a perf a perfectly reasonable beer and pretzels kind of rulings over rules style of game. It'd the, be fun. It's um it definitely it def it it given the aesthetic with it with the art and all that it would be very easy for someone to say that this is trying to be an old school kind of game but once you dig under the hood it really isn't at least the not in the, has... in the OSR kind of sense yeah the most it has in common is it's a role playing game and uses a d20 to do ability checks and attack rolls mm -hmm. um i do th i do think that the way it 
the way it handles some of its terminology is going to throw some veterans off. Just be just because of habit. Hell, I got thrown off a couple times in this. Yeah. But, you know, that's... You and I both know that's going to be a case in almost every game. Terminologies are different from game to game, mm-hmm. whether they're, you know, neo-clones like this, or whether they're new IPs, or whether they're any other sort of clone or homage or derivative thereof terminology changes um it's not up to the authors to change it for us it's up to us to adapt to their nomenclature yeah i will however maintain that um putting putting in putting in example builds for weapons items magic items and the like especially 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 any that ha- that are having custom rules like we like we saw with the weapon creation system yeah a just a just a page alone of that is is going to work wonders. Um, I do think I do think that putting in a few a few um sa- a few sample builds for for archetypes other than the other than the big four is certainly going to be worth it because while there is the, while there are those four archetype examples in the GM section, much le- I I'm reminded of of when I of when I said that. Um, Adventure Conqueror King system is good, but in order to really see what it's capable of, I recommend anyone getting the core book to get the player's companion with it, since that contains the class creation system for the game. Uh, in this, in the same, in the same vein, I think th- I think that providing a f- providing a few more out there archi- archetypes that you can build at level one. Would is would be would go a long way to demonstrate the craziness that can really happen with this thing, because yeah, while you could just play a be- a bog standard sword and board kind of fighter with this system, I think I think doing th- I think um I think I think have I think the expectation of doing that is doing the system that's present here a disservice. Um, also the, the, the whole, the whole simultaneous movement and, inter- and interception, um, I do think trying to, inter- trying to do that on virtual tabletop is going to be tricky. A little bit. Um, cause I'm trying, I'm trying to think of how, of how, of how you do the whole map, mapping things, mapping things out like that. The best I can think of is people drawing arrows and even and even th- and even then, I'm not. I um. I feel like it's going to take a little bit of practice before it sinks in. Uh-huh. The, but over, but overall, despite despite a few stumbling blocks, I'm feeling good about driven into darkness. Sounds pretty awesome. Like, um, if I if I were to if I were to put it under my under my grading system, I'd probably put this under. Under um recommended, not quite not quite strongly recommended, but I can st- but still recommended. Yeah. Um. At the although um this is one of those things where I'd I'd really want to see how people hack it. Especially regarding how freeform a lot of uh, the the kind of trait creation is in this thing. Yeah. But that is that is going to do it for this particular installment of the Valley of the Judged. We'll be we'll be back with the usual Heavens and Heresies affair on fr- on Friday night as we as we always do. And w- and I'm looking forward to that one because I get to because I get to rant about the most snake-bitten class in the, in fantasy gaming. I'm looking forward to seeing the changes. Mm-hmm. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>